So any questions before we start? I mean, in the last week, we kind of uh, rushed over the vectors. I mean, we were, okay, we did the scalar product, the vector product. Uh, you had a homework which, in which you had to do some scalar multiplication and vector multiplications. And vector division doesn't exist. And the equality of two vectors, this is where we had left. This was the last slide I had. And, but basically, if two vectors are equal, we know that each component has to be equal. Remember, vectors are just numbers with a direction. So the numbers have to be equal, and their direction has to be equal. So that basically means that all of its components are equal. So up to this point, any questions? Because, I mean, in the future, we will be just building on what we have learned until that point. So it's important that you understand what we have, have done until this point. The right hand rule. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, scalar product, do you have any questions about that? Well, it's just a definition, for the time being, it's just a de uh, useful definition for us. And so for vectors, we define two kinds of products. Well, scalar product, you just give the scalar product two vectors, and this gives you a number. On the other hand, what's called the vector product, you give this vector product a vector and it gives you back a number. It gives you a vector. Now, what is this vector? We have to define two things. Now, since we are defining the vector product here, we have to find uh, what is the magnitude of the vector product of two vectors and what is the direction of vector product of two vectors. So the magnitude is just like the scalar product. In the scalar product, we use the cosine of the angle between them. The, magnitude, the scalar product of two vectors was just the magnitudes multiplied times cosine of the angle between them. For the vector product, we just calculate the uh, product of the magnitudes of these vectors times the sine of the angle between these two vectors. So if one use of the scalar and vector products you can imagine as if you want to calculate the angle between two vectors you need to obtain its sine and its cosine. So a vector product gives you the sine of the angle between them, and the scalar product gives you the cosine of the angle between them, so that you can determine the sine, the angle between any given two vectors. Now, the direction of this vector product, that is kind of the issue. So if you have two vectors, yes? No, OK. Right. This is one vector pointing in that direction. This is another vector. Question? No. no, OK. So this is one vector. This is the other vector. Let's put them like this. So I know that I can just stretch one sheet along these vectors, right? You are all making beds, I suppose, boys and girls, right? You are all making your beds, tidying up the sheets in your bed. So if you have two beams, you can stretch a sheet on those beams, and it will be flat. So we define. These two vectors, A and B, they give me this plane. They define this plane, in a sense. If you have a plane, there is a single vector perpendicular to it. Well, there are two vectors, two unit vectors perpendicular to it. So let's say this is my plane. This is my A vector. This is my B vector. So this is the plane. So the unit vector, I can choose to point in this direction or in the other direction. There are only two choices. Now, if this is my A vector, this is my B vector, if I take the cross product, I have to first point my fingers along the A vector and then move my fingers towards the B vector with my right hand, not the left hand, with the right hand. So if I, this is my right hand, the first vector, these are my fingers pointing along the first vector, then I just curl them towards the second vector. So my, at initially, my palm should point towards the second vector. It gives me a direction. That is the direction of my A cross B. It is a perpendicular, remember, there is this plane. There is a, a two vertical vectors to this plane, one pointing this way, the other one pointing the other way. And, well, my thumb 
points along one of them, and that is the direction of my A cross B. We will come to that, not yet. Okay. We, will, we will see it when we are uh, studying, especially rotations. So you want to use the larger angle? Yes. So uh, the large, no, you mean this angle? Yes. Well, their sides are equal. They have the, the sine of this angle and this, this angle, they are the same. No, the signs are different, sorry. No, that's the definition. The cosines are the same, but your sign is different. I mean, in the definition, you just put the absolute value of around the sign of. Definition. Just like the coordinate axis, we are free to choose our coordinate axis the way we like. This is also the definition, the way we define it. And it turns out to be useful. This one. So, okay. A product, the scale. Okay. If you look at these two vectors, A cross B and B cross A, look at the definition. Well, both of them will have the same length. So these two vectors, A cross B and B cross A, as vectors, they have the same length. The problem is the direction. Which direction are they pointing to? Both A cross B and B cross A will be perpendicular to the plane defined by A and B. Again, if I go back to my, this is my plane, this is my A vector, this is my B vector. I point my fingers along the A vector with my palm pointing towards the B vector. And my thumb, this is the di direction of A cross B. If I want to calculate B cross A, first I have to point towards the B vector with my palm pointing towards the A vector. So now it's pointing downward. I know that A cross B and B cross A, they have the same magnitude. Furthermore, the definition is such that they are both perpendicular to this plane defined by the vector A and B. They're all along the same line, and they point in opposite directions. If I have two vectors that have the same length but point in opposite direction, then one is the negative of the other one. Okay. Well, I, mean, I don't, okay, I also heard of that uh, definition, but I don't like that the, the description because here I'm talking about the length of a vector, which is by definition positive. It has to be positive. So, I mean, if you want, you can just define this as the absolute value of the sine of alpha. In that case, whether you take this angle or the other larger angle, it will give the same thing. Okay, of course, the magnitude of a vector times the sine alpha just gives us the perpendicular component. Any other questions? Okay, today we will also start with integration. Uh, in your physics, physics, physics career, you will be always dealing with integration. And every equation that you write, most of them will somehow involve some integration. Now, the thing is, just don't get confused about what it is. Now, it's just a symbol, by the way. If you just write ft dt from t1 to t2, it's a symbol. So we have two questions, two things you have to understand. One is, what does this symbol stand for? What is the meaning of this symbol? And the second thing, that you need to, uh, you will have to do eventually, let's say, how, what's the value of this symbol? What does that symbol equal to? In, in this step, 
you will be ca uh, calculating many integrals, simple integrals, complicated integrals. But for me, for most of the, this semester, the meaning of the symbol will be more important. So what does this symbol stand for? You have probably discussed this already on Tuesday, but I, would, I just would like to repeat it. Uh, let's just take this example. This is something that we will quite often do in physics. Physical laws, when we start writing physical laws, they almost always apply to point objects. We have a point, and then we have the Newton's law, F equal to ma, because the position, the position is always the position of a point. When we are studying dynamics, we would like to study larger objects. But in physics, we will always construct the larger objects in terms of very small points. A larger object is just the sum over all the points that make that object. If you consider, as an example, just take this disk with radius equal to 1. We would like to calculate its area. What is the area of this disk? Well, you all know that it is the area is pi r squared, which is around 3.21. Sorry, 3.14, and the, with 4 r equal to 1. Well, how can we measure the area? Let's measure it. I can just go on and just draw some squares. Well, I can just divide this side to three parts and the vertical axis to three parts. I know that the area of my circle is larger than, well, this uh, square is the only square that is completely inside my circle. So that number I denote by a inside or a small. This is one. And all nine squares have one part, not completely, but one part of all nine squares are touching my disk. So I have nine squares which have some part inside my disk. Each one of these squares have an area one. So I know from this figure that, well, a0, this is the area of each square. This is the number of squares that lies entirely inside my disk. This gives the total area which is con uh, contained inside my disk. So this total area is smaller than the area of my disk. But the area of my disk is also smaller than the total area of all squares that have at least one piece inside. So all nine of these have one, this, this number. All nine of these squares, each one having an area one, is inside my, uh, well, they have a piece inside my disk. So I know that just from this grid, I know that the area of my disk is larger than one. It is larger than the area of this one. And it is smaller than nine. It is uh, smaller than the area of all these nine squares. I can divide it into smaller squares. Now, if you look at here, each square has an one-fourth the previous area. Only these four squares are completely inside my circle. This has this part outside. This has these parts outside. This has a very small part inside. So only these four are inside my disk. And there are 16 all these, these 4, 8, 12, 16 squares have even a small, have a, at least a small part inside my disk. So the area of these 16 squares, this one, is larger than the area of my disk. And the area of my disk is larger than the area of these four disks. So it gives me the area is larger than 1, but smaller than 4. Remember, before it was, it was larger than 1, smaller than 9. By taking a finer grid, I have the 9 has just become 4. I'm getting closer to 3.14. Well, I can divide it even further. So how many, if you count them, now you can count at home, there are 32 squares completely inside. And 60 squares contain at least a small bit inside the disk. And the area of each disk is 1 over 16. So the area of my disk is larger than 2 and smaller than 
So I'm already getting quite close to 3.14. But you can go even further, divide it into smaller and smaller and smaller bits. And the smaller you go, the more precise. These two numbers will start to get closer and closer to each other with the total area always lying in between these two numbers. So just some notation. A0 by A0, I just denote the area of each one of these squares, small squares. And A small is the number of squares that lie inside my disk, completely inside my disk. So this is, in a sense, is nothing but a sum. Well, this symbol stands for the sum. And this is the condition. So I am summing over all squares completely in the circle, in the disk. And each disk, each uh, square contributes, well, there is one of them, contributes an area A0. So A0 times A small is just this sum. For the other part, the A large, is nothing but, again, it's just sum. Each square contributes this much to the total area. It's a sum over all squares that contain at least a very small part in my disk. And I know that my area, the exact area of my disk, is between these two sums. We had seen that as I take this A0 smaller and smaller, remember here, I'm just taking a smaller and smaller, finer and finer grid. So each square is having a smaller and smaller area. If I could continue this indefinitely, eventually these two numbers would coincide and the, my area would also coincide with them. Uh, eventually, if I could repeat this procedure infinitely. So in this limit, uh, if I continue dividing further and further, I'm taking the limit that each one of these areas is going to zero. In this limit, both limits, the upper and limit, lower limit for my area, they will approach and become equal, and I would eventually obtain the sum. So this limit is what we define, but this limit of these sums is what we define as the integral. This is what we call the integral. Integral is just a sum of contributions from different parts. Each part contributes one, and I'm summing all the small areas inside my disk. This is how I define it. Of course, if I, when I take the limit A0 goes to zero, remember, each, one, each contribution of each one of these terms is zero. So each square contributes A0, one times A0 to the area. It becomes zero. But at the same time, there will be infinitely many squares. So I'm summing infinitely many terms which are zero. Well, this is just the zero times infinity uncertainty, if you remember from your uh, mathematics courses. And that if you multiply zero by infinity, you might end up having a finite number. And that finite number is our integral. Rather than just writing the limit as you as a zero goes to zero of the sum of this many terms, we just write this symbol. So whenever you see this symbol, just remember it is just a sum and nothing else. Don't get confused. But evaluating integrals is a completely different story. And things do can get really complicated. But in this course we will be mainly dealing with quite simple integrals, integrals of polynomials, the logarithmic function. This trigonometric, the integrals of trigonometric functions, which you had reviewed on Tuesday. And in any case, in the exams at least, you will be able to care, uh, take a formula sheet with you. And you, can, you should write all these integral formulas that you would like to have with you. OK, we said here I divided everything into squares. Why squares? Why can't I divide it into other things? Well, I can. And this is just one possible choice. As long as eventually you get infinitely small things which do not overlap and which cover all your 
region, you, you are allowed to use it. This is another choice. Rather than taking very small squares, I can just assume disks, uh, rings, concentric rings. Each one having a width delta r, and well, I just picked up an arbitrary one, a typical one. I just denoted its radius by r. The inner radius is r, the outer radius. Well, the inner radius is the radius of this circle. The outer radius is the outer edge. Well, r is the inner radius. r plus delta r is the outer radius. So I can again write the area of my disk as the sum of the areas of each one of these rings. And well, if you just imagine one of these rings, I can just cut it at some point and straighten it up. If you just straighten up this ring, well, the outer edge will have a, well, you will get a weird, weird shape object that one side will be quite uh, long, the other side will be short. The longer side will be 2 pi times r plus delta r. This is the circumference of the disk. So then the question is, by the way, how do we know that this is the circumference of the disk? How do you know that 2 pi r is the circumference of a, a circle of radius r? Human? How do we know? I mean, we can measure the radius. We can measure the circumference. How do we know that it's defined like that? I mean, for centuries, we didn't know this relation. This is quite recent. Well, quite recent in the last four or five, no, 1,000 years, let's say. And for quite many years, we as people assumed that pi was just 3. It's only in the last century, probably, we can have a precise value of pi. Hmm? Yeah, th this is how we define the pi, in a sense, yeah. Hmm. Agreed. Okay. So if I straighten this ring up, I know that it will fit in a rectangle whose thickness is delta r. Well, this is delta r, so it will fit in a rectangle of width delta r. And height 2 pi r plus delta r, This is because this is the longer side of the object that I obtained by straightening out this ring. And it will con contain completely a rectangle whose width is delta r. Height is the smaller side. So I have this weird object straightened out sides and uh, tilted edges. It completely fits into a rectangle. Well, the width is delta r. The height is the longer side. If I consider that rectangle, it will completely fit in it. If I take the rectangle whose height is the smaller side, then that rectangle will be completely contained in this object. So the area of this small object that I obtain by just extending it, straightening it up, will be in between these two. So this delta A, the area of this ring, will be between 2 pi r delta r and 2 pi r plus delta r delta r. Well, the next step you can guess. OK, so I op already obtained the area of an arbitrary ring whose inner radius is r thickness delta r. So to obtain the total area of the disk from these delta a's, what should I do? Sum them up. So this is the limit I have. If I just sum all of them up, uh, if I just sum all these things, it will be smaller than the area I have, which is nothing but the sum of all these delta A's. The area will be smaller than the sum of the upper limits. And again, if I take the limit as the thickness goes to 0, this sum just becomes an integral. Well, this sum 
just becomes an integral, 2 pi r. I'm summing 2 pi r. Each one has a thickness delta r. So I'm summing over all possible values of r from 0 to r, to capital R. And then I obtain pi r squared as the area of my disk. Well, the difference between this example and the previous example was, in the previous example, I was just summing ones over all circles, over all squares. Here, I'm just summing 2 pi r's over all these disks. Uh, it still gets and gives me the area. If you propose any other means of dividing the total area of my disk into very small pieces that cover my disk completely and that do not overlap, it will be also a valid way of calculating the area of the disk. So it's not just these two methods that you can use to calculate it. You can imagine any kind of integral. The difference is that you have to divide this. You have to find a way to divide this disk first. Once you establish your method of division, then you, you have an expression for the area for the integral. This is what we will always do in this, in, well, what you will be also doing throughout your uh, physics career. Get a macroscopic object, divide it into smaller bits, calculate the contribution of each one of those bits to whatever you are calculating, and sum them over up, which is the integral. Well, short story, long story short, whenever you see an integral, do not get confused. It is just a sum. It is just like adding one, two, three, which gives you six. So this is what it stands for. Of course, probably next semester you will be studying integration and differentiation in more detail in your calculus courses. But this much interpretation would be enough for us. Any questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. True. Well, that is funny thing about the limit. So, uh, when we are taking this limit as delta r goes to zero, if this number over here and this number over here have a number, well, let, let's let's look at it like this. What does this mean? Delta r goes to zero. You will have the formal. Uh, definition in the mathematics courses. This just tells me that you give me any number, any small number. In that case, I can choose delta r smaller than that. This is the meaning of this. Now, what this tells me that, what I can prove is that in this limit, the difference between this number and this number, I can make arbitrarily small, infinitely small, or let's say, the difference between this number and this number, I can make arbitrarily small. So if, you, if area is anything different than pi r squared, in that case, I can find some delta r in which this number or this number will be uh, either, either larger than this number or this number will be smaller than this number. But I know that this number has to be in between these two all the time. Now, when I write these, take the limit. I know that the, this number is always smaller than a, always smaller than this number. When I take the limit, I have to convert this smaller than or equal to sign also. Limit has that weird property that this number, although for any finite value of delta r, it, this sum will not give me the integral. If I can actually take the, this limit, not any finite value, but this limit, then the, this number and this number will overlap, and the area has to lie between, in between. Or the area has to be that number, which is this number. Questions? Thank you. 
before um, taking all of the distance, I have to uh, take the all of the um, remaining distance. True. True, but uh, at that time I can never reach that place. But in real life, I can reach. Like so, how many of you looked up what Zeno's paradox is? Hands. I want to see some hands. I know he did. OK, hands up. How many of you read what Zeno's paradox is? The one that you are talking about now. <laughs> well, the paradox says this one. I mean, the idea is, is motion possible? Well, you can say that, OK, what kind of a Unit. Well, let me first talk about what this Zeno's paradox is. Okay, now. Hmm? Let me first talk, tell what Zeno's paradox is to the other ones. It states that, as your friend had said, if I want to go from here to over there, I first have, have to cover half of that distance. Then I have to cover the remaining half, and then the remaining half, and then the remaining half. So my motion from here to there would include infinitely many steps. But no physical phenomena can contain infinitely many steps. Physics is about finite things. So in the, that, according to Zeno, proves that motion is not possible. It's just an illusion. Well, by the way, there are, uh, okay, you can say, well, that is kind of, uh, do you like the idea? Do you agree with it, that motion is not possible? You agree, okay. Any motion is impossible. Is impossible. You, you are not moving. So you are not scratching your <coughs> knee. <laughs> It's just what? Activity of some energy. What do you mean by activity? <coughs> so okay, so there's no uh, from there's no motion. We arrived at the conclusion there's no matter. Okay. Interaction. Well, energy is, ma is what we call the matter, by the way. Hmm? Energy is what matter. There, well, there is M. M is energy. No. <laughs> the weight is. Hmm? There is no weight. Well, weight is the. F force, gravitational force. Yes. So, there, so you have a weight, no? Uh, <laughs> you observe weight. Uh, can I explain my point of view? Sure. Uh, according to me, when the time passes through me, <laughs> when the time passes through me, I'm not the old one. I'm changing. Okay. So that uh, the particle, the moon, is not me. Well, that's another. Hmm. Well, that, okay, then I will ask, what is me? Then we go to the philosophical question. Well, okay, let, let's, let's not go to that depth. Okay, so you had a comment. Okay, in the first step, she goes the halfway. So you say motion is possible, you say motion is impossible. Well, the question, the majority of physicists, let's say, or people, let's say, they accept the motion is possible. 
the majority. There are still people, good scientists by the way, not just crackpots, claiming that motion might be impossible. Then you would ask, we are observing motion, so what, we are, what are we observing then? And their explanation is that it's just like TV. In TV, there are action movies there, where you have lots of motion going around, but nothing is moving inside your TV. It's just the pixels are moving around. There is one pixel activated, then the, the next pixel is activated. The pixels are not moving, it's just one of them is light, gives light at one instant, in the next, next instant, the other one gives light. Yeah. There are models like that of universe. So the question is, what is the universe made of? We said that, okay, let's take the limit as delta t goes to zero. Is it a physical limit? Can we increment time by arbitrarily small amounts? Or does time go in steps, in discrete steps? Or the same, in the same way, can we really move continuously? Can we stop at an arbitrary point? Or again, motion is discretized. I can be at this point, I can be at that point, but I cannot be in any point in between. Of course, these scales, these time scales and these uh, distance scales is very small. Currently, we cannot even measure it. According to our measurements, time and space seems to be continuous. But that doesn't mean that in the future, we will discover that time and space can be discrete. Other questions? Can anybody, everybody read the blackboard? I will write a bit large. Quiz time. Close your notebooks, close your books, just pick up a paper. So I have these two simple vectors, x hat plus y hat plus z hat, this is the vector a. The vector b is x hat plus y hat minus twice z hat. So in part a, I want you to show that a and b vectors are perpendicular to each other. In part b, I want you to calculate a plus b, a minus b, and the scalar product of a with b. And in part c, I want you to calculate the length of A and the length of B. Those who finish can give a break. You have at most 10 minutes. <laughs> 